So ladies and gentlemen, uh, join me in welcoming the gentleman who is going to be the one that delivers the main talk. And let me introduce him as the president of the African Development Bank. He previously served as Nigeria's Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development until his appointment as minister in 2010. He was vice president of policy and partnerships for the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. This gentleman has done a lot of great things. He's been a first in so many sectors and so many areas of endeavor. In 2015, he was elected as the president of the African Development Bank. He is definitely, as we know, the first Nigerian to hold this post. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Akiumi Adishina. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Praise the Lord. I can hear you from here. Praise the Lord. Well, first and foremost, let me thank Mr. Kayode Akitemi. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I know Kayode very well uh, when he was at uh, the channel's television. And uh, he did a fantastic job there. But I learned this morning from him that he has also set up his own television station uh, called Plus TV. So you are galvanized. Your Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Professor Yemi Oshibajo, my dear brother and friend, Pastor Joseph Obayemi, National Overseer of the Redeemed Christian Church of God and the National Chairman of the Redeemed Men's Fellowship, Pastor Adeyokunu, the National Treasurer, Pastor Charles Pande, actually, Pastor is actually here. He just went to get me some water. He's so kind. Please thank him for me. Okay, thank you. The pastor in charge of Lagos Region 11, Pastor Idowu Iluyomade, pastor in charge of the city of David. Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka, my dear brother, eminent guests and speakers, all of you, the bankers that are here, my friends. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, actually when Pastor Baimi was saying, your, he said, arise, O ye men. I recognize that we have so many other women here, so I would say, arise, O ye women, if you are in the hall. And also, arise, O ye men. Thank you. Yes, please. So good morning to you all. First and foremost, congratulations to the redeemed Christian Church of God, to the redeemed Christian Church of God, Men's Fellowship, for the event and for inviting me to the honor of speaking to you today. It's such a great pleasure to be invited to speak with men and, of course, women. Let me start by wishing you a very happy and prosperous new year. May God make it a bountiful year. Enjoy peace, good health, with success in Jesus' name. Now, I would like to see by a show of hands how many of you have ever been to an optician or an ophthalmologist. And how many of you wear prescription glasses like I'm wearing? Okay, and some of you probably have laser ones that are, you've had laser surgery, so you can see clearly. If you are uncertain, you have been told that 2020 is perfect vision. This year, 2020, is very important. And therefore, it's going to be for you the year of perfection of your vision. 
Vision is more than the ability to see. It is the ability to envision and see the future clearly as if you are already there. So I came here today to speak to you about realizing your vision for success. Now before I go on, let me tell you how I accepted your invitation to come and speak to you today. My schedule for the year is so packed already. And when I got the invitation, I talked to my staff, they looked at it, and the program was actually impossible for me to make. And I sent a word to a pastor. I said, please tell pastor that there are so many conflicts in my schedule. Unfortunately, I won't be able to be here. And then it was the 31st of December. And Mr. Ajidi Oweye, who is here, was sent by Pastor Pande to come and see me in Ibadan. And I say, unfortunately, my staff tell me the schedule is such that I won't be able to make it. And then 31st of December, I had just finished praying and trying to go into the new year. I had two letters, envelopes at the side of my bed, my bedside. And at five minutes to, 12, to midnight, I decided I finished praying to turn. And the spirit tell, told me, he said, look at the envelope that is right beside your bed. I picked up the envelope, but I picked up the wrong one. I said, no, pick the other one. I picked the other one, and it was the same letter that had been sent to me for this invitation. As I opened it, the Holy Spirit told me this. Akin, I know your schedule is so busy. But if it was Chancellor Merkel or President Macron that invited you to come to a meeting today, will you not be there? And I said, yes, I will be there. And then it said, what greater honor can you have and what greater calling can you have than to go and inspire the people of God? I did not tell my staff. I didn't tell anybody. My wife was right beside me. I didn't even tell her. I just picked my phone and I sent a message straight to Mr. Jide Owoye. I said, tell the pastor I am coming. And the next day, my staff were running helter-skelter. What happened? I said, God told me to go. So that's why I'm here. So I came to speak to you on a mission about realizing your vision for success. But to properly situate our discussion, it's important to have a proper perspective on success. Success must be seen only from the perspective of the one who will ultimately determine whether one has succeeded and who will reward life's successes in every endeavor of life, whether in the world of academia, the private sector, government, or in your own homes, success criteria must be clearly set. Key performance indicators are what are used by managers, leaders to align corporate goals. In the same way, God who is God of purpose and destiny sets its own key performance indicators. The key question is, how will God measure success? Let me repeat it. The key question is, how will God measure success? Turn to the person next to you and ask them, how will God measure your success? The Bible gives very clear indications of how the assessment will be done. The assessment will not be on the basis of whether you 
called on God, as important as that is, it will not be based on what you said. It will be based on what you did with what you have. Matthew 25, 31 to 46, gives you a very vivid picture of how God measures success. There are those who felt they had it all in the world, but for God to do the things God expected. They had riches, but they forgot the poor. They had power, but he oppressed the people. In the world, they had it all. But in the end, they lost it all. There are many roads to success as defined by people or the world. But there is only one way to success defined by God. Doing it God's way. Let me pause and welcome His Excellency, the Vice President. Your Excellency, Mr. Vice President, welcome, sir. It's good to see you again. As I said, there are many roads to success as defined by people or the world. But there is only one way to success as defined by God, doing it God's way. And that way is shaped by honesty, fairness, and integrity. Any success achieved without honesty, fairness, and integrity is not geometric success, but geometric failure. To succeed, you need a plan. But then you must act. Words don't lead to success. You cannot swim to the shore if you don't want to get wet. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 4. It says, He who looks at the wind will not sow, and he who watches the cloud will not reap. To achieve success that's geometric, you must engage. You must scan your environment. Yes, there are challenges, no doubt about that, but it is critical that we shift our focus away from the wind of challenges to the clouds of possibilities. The bottom line is that your success is determined by your vision. So today, I'm asking you, what do you see? What do you see? What is your vision for your own success? And what are your plans to achieve it? Opportunities abound all around. African economies are growing very well. Last year, 17 countries grew at 3 to 5%. 20 countries grew at 5% and above. Foreign direct investment in Africa last year grew by 11%. Foreign direct investment in Asia grew by only 4%. Foreign direct investment for the world declined by 13%. And foreign direct investment for developed countries declined by 23%. Africa is where the growth is rising fastest in terms of foreign direct investment. So let's get some basic facts right. Africa's population, currently estimated at 1.2 billion, is rising very fast. McKenzie, in their recent book, Africa's Business Revolution, some of you might have read that book that Acha Leke and their team put together, had this to say. Nearly 90% of Africa-based companies and 58% of those based in other regions expect their revenues in Africa to grow over the next five years and most plan to expand their African footprint to additional countries. 
this is the continent you're living in. The size of business to business, consumer to consumer expenditures, will rise to $5.6 trillion in the next five years. The size of the food and agricultural market in Africa will rise to $1 trillion just in the next 10 years. Africa's continental free trade area, which unites all the economies of the continent, will be worth, is worth a whopping $3.3 trillion. Hello? That tells you that is the largest free trade zone in the world since the creation of the World Trade Organization. Welcome to the new Africa. Welcome to the place of opportunities. Why do you think everyone is having summits on Africa? Just last week, I was in London for the UK-Africa Summit. His Excellency President Buhari was there with 16 other heads of state and government. You have the China-Africa Summit, Russia-Africa Summit, Japan-Africa Summit, India-Africa Summit, just to mention a few. What are these countries seeing? They are seeing opportunity. They are seeing an Africa that will soon become the size of China and India taken together today. When China woke up, the world changed. When Africa finally wakes up and it is waking up there, it will be the biggest economic miracle you've ever seen. I thought you would keep your camp, a clamp for Africa for that. In this imagined ecosystem, Nigeria needs to position itself very well. Opportunities abound from agriculture, ICT, services, fashion, the creative arts, entertainment, financial services, hospitality services. I was talking to His Excellency, the Vice President, when I went to visit him, and he had things to say to me about his visit to Silicon Valley, about the kind of companies that they were talking about there, and how they wanted to create that here. And I remember telling His Excellency Vice President that the digital economy that you're trying to build, that we are ready to support that. We are ex still expecting that we will be able to put money, about $500 million, to support that. So the potential for successful businesses in Nigeria is enormous. For a moment, think of the size of the Nigerian market. Our exploding population is expected now at two, is projected to be 206 million for this year. No market is bigger than the Nigerian market. Yes, the population is a challenge, but it is also a huge opportunity that cannot be ignored by anyone serious about business. In the Bible, a prophet called Elijah told the king of Israel after a period of dry spells, when everyone was discouraged and perhaps had given up hope that things would change. He said, get ready, it's going to rain. I hear the sounds of abundant rain. The recent policy of the Central Bank of Nigeria to limit access to risk-free fixed income securities, such as treasury bills, will have the effect of lowering yields further. A policy to raise the loan to deposit ratios will drive banks to lend more in order to stimulate growth. And Ben, you here, the bankers are here, you need to lend more. These remedies will provide good opportunities to invest in equities, but also to support entrepreneurs looking for lower interest rates to run their businesses. There is no magic to economics. These initiatives will drive greater incentives. So today, I hear the sound of abundant rain. It may not thunder, there may not be wind, but I can tell you the cloud is forming like the cloud the size of a man's hand. I can hear the sound of abundant rain. As Minister of Agriculture, I work hard with my team 
to help turn agriculture into a business in Nigeria. We change the mindsets of Nigerians away from agriculture as a way of life to agriculture as a business, as a source of wealth. When we launched the rice revolution in northern Nigeria, especially in Kebi, most Nigerians were actually not aware. There was only one integrated rice mill at the time, the one that would process your paddy into finished rice. By that time, in 2011, that rose to 24 in 2014. One of those Nigerians that did a fabulous job of that is actually a member of your church, Mr. Ajide Owe, if you stand. He's the chairman of the Elephant Group. Thank you for your work. As Nigeria's rice hit the market with excellent grain quality, Nigerians were unaware that the popular staple was homegrown. And I want to thank the president and thank the vice president for continuing that policy. Please put your hand up to them. The businesses of several rice entrepreneurs took off. The rice value chain revolution was unleashed, and some of those early entrepreneurs now dominate the market for rice. I remember the day Aliko Dangote walked into my office. You know, billionaires, they don't take appointments. He just knocked and he came in. And he said, I came to see you. And he and I used to have uh, disagreements on policy and stuff for quite some time. And he, I, as soon as he came in, I said, Alaji, what are we going to fight about today? He said, no, 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 we're not fighting. I just came to tell you that your policies are the right policies. And I came to tell you I've decided to change my business model. I said, to what? He said, I've decided to move away from being an importer to being a domestic producer. And he said, just so that you know I'm serious about this, I will put $300 million down in the commercial rice production million processing rice in Nigeria. Of course, as minister, I jumped up my best day as minister. I called Kofi Annan, God bless his soul. He's my mentor. And I said, Mr. Annan, this is what happened. Mr. Annan told me, he said, Akin, the day you get your largest importer to become your largest producer, that is what I call success. In my case, that's geometric success. And then three months after that, Mr. Dangote Alaji came back to my office. He said, I have changed my mind. I said, what have I done wrong? He said, no, I have not changed my mind from doing what I said. I just changed my mind for $300 million to $1 billion. Several youth have taken their point to agriculture. I've always said it in this country, that the millionaires and the billionaires are not going to come from the oil and gas industry. They are going to come from the food and agriculture industry. So if you want to be a millionaire, billionaire, and you see Aliko Dangote going one direction, you better follow him. Let me say that a fund that I helped to set up here called FAFIN was $33 million private equity fund. It's now worth $66 million here. That's a 100% increase. And it's supporting so many things in Nigeria, including shea butter, kocharis rice, local rice dairy farm, LNZ, that's now hugely successful dairy company. Now, I know that I had lots to say, but I gave this to His Excellency the Vice President. That's a book that I have, which is called Against All Odds. And so a little bit of, um, it's not a promo really, but I got nothing from the book. Somebody else wrote it. But I just want you to see it because it has a lot of lessons about what was done here. It's called Against All Odds. You may want to get a copy for yourself. Let me turn to the case of Nigeria again. Take the case of Andela, a Nigerian IT company with $181 million in investment funding. Today it plans to train 100,000 software developers. There are so many other Andelas here today who are creatively raising the corporate performance bar. 
I trust that you do not think, ladies and gentlemen, that entrepreneurship is just for young people. If you do well, you've just made a mistake. It's not. Entrepreneurship has no age limit or barrier. We are all bombarded with an asymmetry of information that has a tendency to primarily showcase exciting things about young entrepreneurs. Yes, there's been a lot of this in the IT business. Venture capital funds also tend to promote such businesses a whole lot more. So when the word entrepreneurship is mentioned, many people instinctively think that's for the youth. Hello? Well, results show that people aged 50 to 65 actually form the largest share of entrepreneurs that go into business that become high growth businesses. 50 to 65. In a landmark piece of research by the US Census Bureau and researchers at MIT, they found that your best age to be an entrepreneur is when you are middle aged. Listen to some of their compelling findings. 50 year olds have 200% higher chance of succeeding and growing phenomenal businesses than someone that's in their 30s. Someone that's 40 years old is 210% more likely to start a business that's going to be successful compared to someone that's 25. Benjamin Jones put it so well, and I like it. The longer you've been around, the better your odds. Venture capital funds, no doubt, will continue to look for businesses run by much younger people. Why? Simply because they believe they are smarter. That's because they listen to the likes of Zuckerberg, who said young people are just smarter. You think so? I don't think so. To my mind, you cannot discountenance experience which comes with age. Generally, older people are wiser. When you have an issue, who do you go to? Is it not Papa Gio? Huh? Is he 20 years old? Is he 30? No. Older people are wiser. Older people have a tremendous amount of experience, networks, resources, managerial capacities, and greater patience to see things through. They tend to not need venture capitalists because they have their own pool of capital and their savings. They can simply invest their savings and watch their businesses grow. Chris Farrell, in an article in the Bloomberg Business Week, it's called Older Americans Are Starting More Businesses Than Ever, had a subtitle that I like. It says, retire, reboot, become an entrepreneur. Retire, reboot, and become an entrepreneur. And here is why, ladies and gentlemen. A guy called Erwin Kaufman Foundation found that the highest increase in the share of entrepreneurs was among 55 to 64 year olds. Just think of the following for a moment. Harlan David Sanders, who created Kentucky Fried Chicken, started the business at the age of 65. Consider the case of Leo Goodwin Sr. and his wife, Lillian, who founded Geico, America's second largest insurance company. Leo was age 50 when he started the company. 12 years later, the company was publicly listed. Today, Geico is worth $26 billion, employing 40,000 people and insuring over 24 million people. Lesson, don't plan to retire. Plan to fire up. Entrepreneurship has no age limit. To prosper phenomenally, Nigeria needs to boost many more entrepreneurs, and many of them are here today. 
it needs to create more wealth creators in order to add wealth to the nation and beyond. Let us be clear about one thing, though. Successful nations are not always the richest nations. You can be a rich nation with a poor population. Successful nations are the ones where the quality of life of their people is high. So unless it is not so much about national wealth, it is more about people wealth. For that matter, wealth in terms of access to quality education, wealth in terms of access to universal health, wealth in terms of access to security of life and property, wealth in terms of creating quality jobs for citizens, wealth in terms of affordable social services for all. Successful nations always bequeath to their next generation quantum of wealth, not quantum of poverty or misery. Successful nations reduce inequalities and inequities. They are nations for all, not nations for the few. Moving forward, let us also learn to persevere. Let us learn to persevere. Success does not come in torrents. Success comes in trickles, little trickles. So, never give up. Never give up. Now, let me tell you my story. I have faced tough times myself. I remember when I was a student in the United States, I left Nigeria with only 500 Naira on me. I got to the United States, maybe two things I would tell you about it, actually. And I was given a Nigerian federal government scholarship. I arrived in New York. I walked into the embassy. And I said, we are here. That was a colleague of mine. I don't actually know him. We were uh, given a uh, uh, scholarship together. And we got in there, and they said, why are you here? I say, I'm here because we have government scholars from Nigeria. We just got a scholarship. And there was this guy who walked in, Mr. Vice President, and says, you see, we have not paid our rent for this building for a long time. And Nigeria had the audacity to give you a, a paper that you are on government scholarship. We are going to give you a ticket to go back to Nigeria because we can't pay your scholarship. So I said, no, you have to pay my scholarship. He said, no, except God robs a bank in New York. Then you will have your scholarship money paid. I said, no, I know the God I serve. He is not going to rob a bank, but I will get my money right here in New York. And so at 4 o'clock, we went into an hotel. We were so poor. We went into the, um, uh, what's this, YMCA. YMCA, this particular hotel was in nowhere. And our bed, uh, we had to use it to, to close the door. It tells you what kind of hotel I was staying in. It was a double bunk. And the bathroom was in a line. You're all in a line, one line. And in the morning, the guy was called Emeka Ojuku the other student that we were together. We haven't met before. I asked Emeka Ojuku, I said, we are going to go back to the embassy and we are going to ask them to pay us. He said, no, they told us that they can't pay us. I said, Emeka, do you pray? He said, no, I don't pray. I said, why? He said, because I am a Rosicrucian. I said, really? You are a Rosicrucian? I've just been sleeping in the same bunker bed with a Rosicrucian overnight. I said, okay. The Bible tells me whatever two of... I said, I will pray and you will say amen. Can you do that? He said, yes. And so I prayed and he said, amen. So we went. We got to the embassy the same guy, you know, devil is terrible. He showed up and he said, you guys are still here. I said, yes. He said, I told you, God will have to rob a bank. I said, no, it's not going to happen. 
And then we sat there, were students from all over the states, they were all there. And all of a sudden, at about almost 2 p.m., we've been there since about 10. Then somebody came out and said, who is Akin Adeshino here? I said, I. He said, the Consul General wants you. So I walked in. You know, big walk, long walk to freedom, it looked like. So as I walk right towards this guy on the big desk of his, with trepidation, poor student, he said, what is your name? I said, my name is Akin Adeshino. Where are you from? I said, I am from Ogun State in Nigeria. He said, which town are you from? I said, from Ijebubo in Ogun State. He said, which area in that town are you from? I told him, I am from Ojoa. He said, which compound are you from? I told him he had married my, for my father's compound. And so he called, he just dialed, he called one guy to come in, and it was the same guy. He said, pay this man. I thanked him. I even basically prostrated. He said, don't worry, don't worry. Anytime you have a problem, call me. We don't have money, but at least you are paid. I walked out. I didn't say anything to Ojuku. I sat down next to him. Not quite two minutes. Same guy came out. Who is Ojuku here? He said, I. Emeka Ojuku walked in. He did exactly the same thing. Pay this guy. He paid him. Then he said, all the students from America that were all lobbying, they should just send them all away. We were the only two paid. <laughs> Amazing God, isn't it? But then my money, basically, wasn't a lot of money. Remember, I was only paid $500. But for me, it was like I just won a lottery. I spent $500 for six months. I paid my rent. I had to spend on myself and everything else $150 for six months. $150. Just imagine. I had no winter boots. I had no gloves. I had nothing. And one day I was going to the office, I mean to the school. I had my last 25 cents in the world. The last in, I don't mean in America the last 25 cents in the whole wild world. And as I got up, I was staying at the basement of a building. I walked out, and it was freezing, minus 30 with windshield. I stood there freezing in the middle of the road as the bus was passing by. The bus stopped right in front of my house with piles of snow. I quickly rushed in, and I put my hand in my pocket, and I put in the 25 cents into the till. From the look of the guy, the way he looked at me, I knew something was wrong. He said, that will be 50 cents, please. I said, that's all the money I have. Oh, he said, I'm so sorry. So he put his hand in his pocket and he put 25 cents in there. I go to school and I was called by one of my professors. He said to me, Akin, you had a test a few days ago. And in that test, I have your script with me. You scored a 54%. Now, you can imagine somebody in graduate school in the United States, I got first class honors from Nigeria, and he said I got a 54%. I said, yes, I understand that because I have not eaten for the last three days. So the last thing on my mind was the test. I was surviving on water. I said to him, he said to me, well, you are the best in this class I know, but I'm just surprised. So he took the script from me and he put it inside of his drawer. He said to me, put his, he signed me a check for $100 he said, pay me back when you get your PhD.
That was going to be five years afterwards. As I was going out, he said, oh, by the way, go to room 575 in the Cranard building at Purdue University. You will see a man there. His name is called Professor Phil Abbott. Phil Abbott is a world-class mathematician. He said, when you go to him, tell him I sent you to him. I walked over there. He was a man that doesn't talk to people. Mathematicians is that are not like Papa Gio, I can tell you. They are different kinds. And he will face this way, and this is you. He doesn't look at you. Always on computer. And he said, are you the Nigerian student? I said, yes, sir. He said, they tell me that you are smart. I said, I don't know about that. He said, they also tell me you don't have money. I say, I know about that. I don't have any money. He said, you have a scholarship. I said, what did you say? He said, you have an assistantship. That means your fees are paid 100% for the rest of your stay in this university. Just like that. What an amazing God. So don't be discouraged. Don't ever be discouraged. Think of it this way. God understands where you are. God knows exactly your situation. And God has a plan on the way. Now, how do you explain someone who had 25 cents in the world at that time? Freezing cold will be on the front page of Force magazine today. How? God is an amazing God. Never, ever give up because God will never give up on you. I like the song, I Can See Clearly Now, The Rain Is Gone by Jimmy Cliff. It says, I can see clearly now, the rain is gone. I can see all the obstacles in my way. Gone are the dark clouds that hold me blind. It's going to be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. There can be no bright, sunshiny day unless we tackle the issue of unemployment for the youth. Nigeria's youth as Nigeria's best assets. Young, creative, brimming with enthusiasm. They can help power this economy in phenomenal ways. And I know, Mr. Vice President, you're doing a great job with that. What's missing is that they lack, in fact, an ecosystem of support to help them to turn their ideas into viable businesses. My late father used to tell me, God bless his soul, make hay while there is sunshine. During my recent visit to Nigeria in December, I saw on television a number of young people arrested for armed robbery. Of course, they were all university graduates. The greatest risk to Nigeria is not terrorism. Unemployment and discouraged youth are the greatest risk to Nigeria. Youth employment would fuel terrorism so please, everybody, do everything you can to support the government's effort to create jobs in Nigeria. These young people, just like I was at that time, and the sunshine of their lives, this is the time to boost them, time to build them, time to inspire them, time to support them. This decade is critical. And I make bold to say, I call it the Youth Investment Decade. Just think about it. Zuckerberg started his Facebook idea in 2004 in a school dormitory. Eight years later, by 2012, it was listed as a public company. Two years after, in 2014, Zuckerberg was worth a mind-boggling $72 billion, an incredible achievement, all in one decade. I would like you to look at the person next to you, say, it's going to be your decade. Let me come close home 
Aliko Dangote. We're proud of him. He was 21 years old when he launched into business. He took a loan of only $3,000 from his uncle. He invested it in business. He was making, after that, $10,000 profit per month. He paid back his uncle in full in three months. Today, Aliko Dangote is worth 15 billion U.S. dollars. My point here, ladies and gentlemen, it's not the amount of money these folks have or have made. No, that's not what I'm saying. It's the principles underguiding their success. That's what I want to talk about. The first one is vision. What separates achievers from the rest is vision. You simply cannot create what your mind cannot see. This is true for individuals, businesses, and nations. Second, each one of these individuals had entrepreneurial mindsets. Entrepreneurial mindsets. They saw market opportunities that others could not see. Third, they did not dream big. They succeeded in the small and grew to be big. So you must not despise the times of small beginnings. You simply cannot pray that God will make you a Dangote or a Zuckerberg. God will not answer that prayer. What God will ask you is vision. Develop an entrepreneurial mindset and determination to succeed regardless of the odds, challenges, or obstacles in your way. This is where access to critically needed finance comes to play. And you have the bankers here. They're going to be speaking to you about that after every panel. The environment for success must be better developed in Nigeria I congratulate the government for the efforts being made, but we can do a lot more also on power, broadband access, roads, transport, logistics, as we go on. But let's also realize that we all live in an ecosystem. Policy consistency, it's very important, between electoral cycles at national and state levels. Governments change, but businesses and investments must continue. While gains have been made, more still needs to be done. Now, let me shift a little bit and say to you, it's not just about finance. Finance is not enough. You need peace of mind. Hello? You need what? Peace of mind. You must avoid indebtedness. Obtain loans for what you can earn, for what can earn you income, not for consumption or personal items. It's interesting that I as a banker, I'm telling you to watch your borrowing, isn't it? It's not access to finance that gets you into trouble. It is what you spend it on. There are lots of people walking around, driving big cars, looking at luxurious homes of people. They envy them but they are living way above their means. Warren Buffett, one of the richest people in the world, and one of the people I really admire quite a lot, said, if you are smart, you are going to make a lot of money without borrowing. If you buy things you do not need, soon you will have to sell the things you need. Let me read it again. If you buy things you do not need, soon you are going to sell the things that you need. So on a personal level, as you think about success, learn to live below your means. Cut back on unnecessary expenditures. Spend cash, not your credit card. I would rather have a lower standard of life, living debt-free, than have a high standard of living based on debt. The daily debt, of course, is due, and you cannot pay. You have just lost your peace of mind. Again, I repeat, live below your means. 
To succeed at anything, you need passion. Passion empowers vision and turns vision into reality. Warren Buffett again said, without passion, you don't have energy. And without energy, you have nothing. Jack Ma, who created Alibaba, only found out about the internet in 1994. He was enthused about how internet could change China for business to business connections. Now, he did not study computer science. He did not study engineering. He studied English. Ten years after, one decade, ten years after, by 2014, Jack Ma's company was worth 25 billion US dollars. The largest IPO in history. Amazing, all within a decade. This will be your decade. This must be your decade. Your decade to start your business. Your decade to grow it phenomenally. Your decade to make history. It's all in ten years, folks. But do it the right way. To desire is not wrong. To desire wrong things and desire even good things wrongly is what is not acceptable. One of the major challenges we face is greed. Greed causes one to desire what one is not able to afford. Greed comes from wanting to be like others. Greed, simply put, is corrupted desire. To be successful, at least with God and in God's way, you must get rid of greed. Even if you have everything in life, but obtain what you have wrongly, your aroma will be repulsive to people. If the foundation is broken, what can the righteous do? That's a very serious statement to ponder. The response to that statement is to rebuild the foundations. Rebuild the foundations of honesty. Rebuild the foundations of integrity. Rebuild the foundations of service. Ladies and gentlemen, you will be successful. By God's grace, you will be very successful. But learn to manage success. Learn to manage success. When you achieve geometric success, it will come with awards, recognitions from all over. Here is my advice to you. Learn to manage them. The greatest mark of success is humility. The greatest mark of success is humility. I have been fortunate to have received several awards. Most recently, the Forbes African Person of the Year, so will many of you here get and get even more than that? But please, let's not get carried away. While recognition and success is important, it is not the applause of people that matters. It is the applause of God. So, as you prepare for the tremendous opportunities Success, accolades, and awards that lie ahead of you. Let me leave you with my definition of awards. A W A R D S. A means always. W willing. A and ready to deliver selflessly. Always willing and ready to deliver selflessly. Whatever you are recognized for, know it is from God. Know that it's an impetus for you to do even more selflessly. To whom much is given, much is expected. So enjoy your success, but be like Paul in the Bible. Forget the things that are behind you and reach for the things 
that are ahead of you. You've got a decade to achieve geometric success. For those of you who might not have seen my Twitter page for the new year, here is it again. Trust God. Be humble. Work hard. When the new year comes to an end, you will have achieved another very successful year. It shall be your decade of abundant rain. This brings to my mind one of my favorite hymns. There shall be showers of blessing. It always reminds me of success, but success God's way when we trust and obey. So let me read part of it, and I'll ask that we sing it together. It says, there shall be showers of blessing. If we but trust and obey, there shall be season refreshing if we let God have his way. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops around us are falling, but for the showers we plead. I'd like you to please rise with me, and if the musicians can help me with that song, Those who can sing better than I can sing. Showers of blessing. Mercy comes out of the fall. The fall the showers we bring. Let's sing it again. There shall be showers of blessing. Put your 
your hand together for the Lord. Praise the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Please be seated. So, as I close, go and reach for the stars. Better still, be the stars yourself. Enjoy your decade of geometric success and of opportunities. Now, as Papa would say, now somebody say hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That deserves a resounding standing ovation, ladies and gentlemen. That deserves a standing ovation. If you are inspired, you will clap until your hands sweat. If you're galvanized today, you will clap a little bit more, being thankful for what God has done through Dr. Akiomi Adishina. Now this one is for Jesus. Yes, yes, this is for God. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you.